Well, here we are getting ready to plunge into the four priority book and four priority study. Uh, today we're going to take a look at chapter number one. Last uh, time we looked at the introduction, and if you haven't watched that, I hope you'll take the time to uh, take, uh, take that in and, and get that as a context for the whole study that we're getting ready to embark upon. The first priority is, is, a, is based upon a focus on the person of Jesus Christ. And you'll remember, if you're looking at your notes there in the book, that it's a personal, progressive commitment to Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and the thing that I want to focus on here is that the uniqueness of Jesus. The word unique means one of a kind. So as you think about uh, Jesus Christ, and as you think about your faith or the Christian faith, uh, remember that it's not a religion. It's primarily a relationship. People over the years have asked me, said, John, you have walked or had a relationship with Jesus Christ for many, many years. How do you keep that uh, real in your life? And how do you stay fresh in your passion for, for your faith? And I said, because my faith is in a person. It's in a person and in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I want to just kind of work my way down here as we look through uh, the Gospel of John, the first 11 chapters, and see where Jesus Christ was unique, being the master of the things you'll see listed beginning on page number six. First, the master of quality. One of my favorite stories about Jesus uh, turning the water to wine was about this preacher. And the preacher was going uh, across town, and he was zooming through, actually right into town, uh, uh, going to another location when he was pulled over by the police. It was probably about 10.55 a.m. on a Sunday morning. The policeman pulled him over, and he said, Sir, he said, uh, did you realize you were going over the speed limit? And the old preacher said, Well, yes, sir, but he said, I've just been preaching on this side of town. I've got to go to the other side of town to another church, and I'm late. And he says, Well, uh, sir, he said, uh, Oh, by the way, what's that over there on the uh, car seat by you, that bottle? He said, oh, that's my water. kind of keeps my throat lubricated because I speak a lot. He said, sir, can I see that bottle? The preacher said, well, sure. He gave it to the officer, and the officer took the cork out, and he took a whiff of it and smelled it, and he said, sir, I'm sorry to inform you, but that is not water. That is wine. Whereupon the preacher said, praise God, he did it again. Now, there's not an audience here to laugh, and I hope you'll get a chuckle out of that. But the question on each one of these little masters uh, in terms of how it relates to Jesus, the first water to wine would be, where do you need his touch in your life? And so you need to ask that, and as you're discipling others, then you need to ask them, where do you need his touch in your life? Secondly, he's the master of distance. You know, where do you need uh, in your life a sense of hope? Because we can be hopeless, just like this off official was hopeless with his son and yet as far away as the hope uh, seemed to be Jesus without even going to this young boy uh, healed him and made him whole so where are you having a sense of hopelessness in your life remember he can make a difference even in the midst of your hopelessness uh, the third a master of time where are you crippled in your life we all have a limp and we all need a crutch. Somebody said Jesus is a crutch. Well, that in a sense is true, but he is a reliable crutch. Not all crutches will hold you up, but he will. The other one is master of quantity. He fed 5,000 plus. The 5,000, by the way, was just the number of, of men. That did not include, when they counted this in, in the New Testament, the number of women and children. Some said there could have been as many as fifteen to 20,000 people that were fed. But the question is, what could you give to Jesus to multiply out of your life? What could you give to him that he could multiply? He's a master of nature. Jesus walks on water. The question for me is, where do you need his peace in your life? He calmed the storm, and in the same way, he wants to bring peace and calm in your life. Where do you need that peace? Master of circumstances. Um... What, you know, the old boy said, uh, one day he said he was talking to a friend. He asked this guy, he said, well, how are you doing? He said, well, under the circumstances, I'm doing okay. And he looked at him and said, what are you doing under there? So often we live our lives under the circumstances instead of on top of the circumstances. But the question would be here, are there any circumstances in your life where you need his help? And then 
when he raises Lazarus, master of life and death, the question would be, have you been raised to new life because of your relationship with Jesus Christ? And in that passage in John chapter 11, it's very interesting to note when Jesus told those that were there to roll away the stone, out comes Lazarus, bound hand and foot. And then he said something to the men that were there. He says, go and unwrap him or unbind him. One of the things that I've seen over, this year, over the years is a lot of times we have still the, the wrappings of the old life without Christ still holding us back and binding us. And so what's holding you still? What still has you bound up? The second thing I notice out of that is it took some other people to be involved in this man's life to help him be free. You and I need the same thing in our lives. We need others around us that love Christ, but also can come alongside us and help us to uh, be unbound and take the wrappings off so we can be free to be all that Christ wants us to be. So I think those are great things that point to the person of Jesus Christ. On page 8, we talk about and try to define what sin is. I just want to add one comment there. Often when I talk about sin, uh, when I'm teaching, I like to say, to help really describe it, is that sin is a spiritual cancer. It's something so deeply embedded in our human nature that we basically don't want to do what God wants us to do. We want to do what we want to do. So it's something, something deeply embedded in our hearts and our lives and our very human nature. I'm intrigued on page 8, if you go towards the bottom, of how Jesus took plain, ordinary people, and with his touch, he transformed them. It's the same with us. He transforms the lives of normal people who become, with his touch, the kind of men and women he wants us to be. And it says on page 9, I love this, in the second paragraph, only Jesus can transform the hearts of people who have surrendered to his overtures of grace. Only Jesus can change a human being's life. And I know people that I meet with day in and day out whose lives have been a wreck, and yet once they encounter the person of Jesus Christ, everything begins to change. Then on page 10, when we talk about the uh, four things that happen as a result of uh, being disconnected from God, let me just make a couple comments there. I call this the fallout of the fall. The fallout that comes as a result of being disconnected from God, from being disobedient to God. It starts all the way back in the garden, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, particularly chapter 3. But the thing I want you to see is that that when we ask the question in many different ways in our day of time, why in the world is the world so messed up? Here's the answer. Number one, because of what those first people did in their disobedience to God, four things happened that also impact us. They were cut off from God. They were cut off from themselves. They were cut off from others. And everything in creation was thrown off kilter so that now we have natural disasters, we have unexpected things that happen. There's disease, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so I want you to see here, there is a reason why we're in the mess we're in and the day and time in which we live. And so these four things that fall out as a result of the fall uh, are very, very important to make sure you have down and understand that uh, as you communicate uh, who Jesus Christ is and why he is so important in our lives. Page 12 talks about... Um, towards the bottom there, and the great in area, what one act of righteousness brought justica justification for all mankind. Let me give you a definition of justification, which I think is profound. The justification is God's declaring a man or a woman free from all sin and guilt based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross plus nothing else. So it's all of what he did and nothing that we have done will ever secure the salvation, the forgiveness uh, that he uh, has offered and that we so desperately need. Finally, I just want to make a couple comments here in conclusion. The question is, as we come to page 14, how do you know Jesus Christ is really in your life? Do you know that for sure, for sure, for sure? Are you confident of that? There's no way we're going to be confident to help others come to know Christ and have a passion for that unless we are confident about that relationship ourselves. You know, in John 1, 12, 
The scripture says, to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become a child of God or a son of God. And so therefore, his part is he makes the offer. Our part is we have to receive him. Have you received him? Do you know he lives in your life? And if you aren't sure of that, I pray that you will pray the prayer printed here in this chapter and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. Or maybe you say, well, I think he is, but I'm not sure. Well, then maybe you could pray uh, a prayer that my friend years ago who had played football at Georgia Tech told me about. He said, maybe what we need to do is pray the in case prayer. Lord, I think you're there, but in case you're not, I want to get this done and be confident of it and make sure. And so therefore, ask yourself, is he in your life for sure? We say, How can you know for sure? Well, read, if you can, 1 John Chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So whoever has God's Son has life. Whoever does not have his Son does not have life. Verse 13. I write this to you who believe in the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The Lord wants us to know that once we give our lives to him and he invades our very human personality and lives there, that he is there and he will never leave us nor forsake it. He wants us to have that confidence. He wants us to know that. And let me just conclude this by saying that I have never met a man or a woman in my life who's ever come to know Jesus Christ for real, who's ever been the same again, or who's ever been disappointed. Jesus Christ, my friends, will never disappoint you.